probably to Mrs. Uh, Hastings' mother-in-law, and she in turn so. That's not the Hastings that built the theater, was it? Yes. Oh, what? And of course, the Hastings' mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. And she in turn sold to Fort Hastings. So a lot of people call it the Hastings Cottages, Fort Bell Hastings, but he was a Jonathan Layton in the original yeah. deal. But how long ago do you estimate that tower was built? Uh, I don't know. But, but probably around 1880, it may have been 10 or 15 years. What was the original purpose of it? Well, I guess the hiders liked it, the hider people, they liked the tower and the property, and the, the section between one and the tower ridge, and the mariners on the river always could, uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, I don't know if they put their glasses on, there's a spider, but they could see the tower, they could see the time. Yeah. And that's what known as the tower ridge section. And Riverview Place was just a street north, and just the that cut could be included the tower ridge section. And those houses there were built by, um, or about five houses were built there by, Commodore Ross, building his own house at Broadway and was built in 1900. Is that the house that Dr. Krauss was in there? Yeah. Oh. But they were all, all built about the same time? Five of the houses, three on the north side of the street, mm -hmm. were occupied by uh, Mayor Reynolds and his family, the first tenants. Oh, really? In I 11 know. Review Place. I didn't know that. And then they moved up next to me. And then when they moved up next to you, Smith uh, moved over from Tower Ridge, Edmont, was my mother's family. My dad had married in 1903, and the New York uh, part of my mother's family, and my uncle and his mother, grandmother, decided to join hands in a big house in 11 of your place. Well, because I was born in 1910. What was north of you on what is now the River Glen apartment? The, uh, Commodore Ross kept that property there for years from his place up to the Shaw estate. And it was originally all Robert Minton property, or the Minton family property. And uh, Shaw got his, his spot there. And then Ross, in between Shaw's and what he place, kept it for a garden, a big extensive garden. His wife was quite a uh, gardener. And hired a garden there, a beautiful, uh, probably everything, asparagus, potatoes. But mostly vegetables or vegetables flowers? And flowers, and flowers, and had a, like a Japanese, um, one of the daughters. Uh, oh, really? Uh, the formal garden. Type of very quite formal, and the, if you walk down the, the gravel past it, it was very beautiful. Did they still have that, that wire fence, the metal fence along the Broadway at that time? I think that fence, yes, but I think that fence originally came from the Christie property. Uh, that was along the long mm -hmm. sure. Burton and uh, the uh, apartment side. The apartment side. I think that's where most of that fence came from. Um, that, when Mrs. Ross died around 1920, they lost their son in the war. Mm -hmm. they, they lost a sort of, he, he remarried, but the property was never picked up again. Those, they're quite attractive, though. I've heard reference to them before. Uh, when would you say, when did the uh, gardens, uh, when did they finally build the River Glen apartment? Well, they came there. in 19, well, uh, it was, it was happened, Condor Ross was Condor of the Tower of Jack Club, and he loaned the club for the, the two lots on, on Riverview Place where Dr. Mink's house is now, mm -hmm. and the old property in, in the, that, that area. And the property in back of there, the, the where Lower River then is, so the club had the Yacht Club had four courts. Oh. And they they used those courts. Oh, down below. Down below. Well, they I used to play there. Yeah, they oh. used the, the top courts were well when he sold the property to Dr. Mink mm -hmm. and the that those courts by nineteen thirty one. The lower courts were used up to nineteen thirty nine when the Shores bought the property. Sure, I remember those courts well. They were nice courts, clay courts. Yeah, them up in good shape. Let me just check. From the, see, see that? Yeah, what I, does that mean? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it does that when you're talking. Yeah. Okay. No, I guess that's just the way it works. We'll have to keep checking and make sure. I, I put a cord along the case. Just yeah. I don't want to run short. We'll put it close to you. Might as well close. Well, I can throw it away. Yeah, yeah, you on there now? Yeah, it's, it's working. It <laughs> doesn't matter. It goes on for so long that you have to wear so long. Yeah. All I do is I block it out and you transfer oh, when you're picking it up. What's the difference? And I edit it anyhow. What we'll do, so you don't have to worry about what you're saying. We're going to write it out. We're going to eliminate, cut.
combine it, rephrase it. You know, the thing is, we're not worried. Isn't I think one of the problems using a tape just as is. Maybe people would be, be reluctant because what if they if they said something and read it back, yeah. it may not reflect favorably on somebody or themselves. This way, you can act, you can edit the thing. It may take some spontaneity, but other than that, some people would feel reluctant to yeah. do it. And that's and I feel more comfortable about myself. You know, those courts have a history. Oh, really? Why? Yeah, well, I've I've done a tennis history of these yeah. things, and I can give it to you. Oh, we should have that. Uh, I. Then I revamped it for every amount of tennis clubs of little promotion there too. But um, actually, they saw uh, these names would not be in the in the um, the names I'll mention now are not in the club history. But uh, for instance, the Hastings, the manner people played down there, it was uh, in the the courts on Review Place were quite popular. And for instance, uh, Frank Whoopman, the Whoopman mm -hmm. family played down there. Carlos and mm -hmm. Frank, they later became, um, and Ralph, they were, became Morgan, the famous actor. Oh, really? And, oh, uh, his sister lived on Elm Place. That's right, and this is... Uh, next, I think she lived there after the Miles. Sure, she was the last, uh, she survived, uh, she was the last survivor in the family. Yeah, next one. Um, Vincent Richards came up to play exhibitions there when he was 14, 15, and 16. Yeah. The fellow he played, Alan Bear, one of the best players in town. Yeah. But he, he beat Richards the first year about 6'2", six, 6'2". Two, six, two. The next year was about two sets. Yeah. And when Richards was 16, Alan couldn't hold a candle to him. Yeah. But he brought him up every year. Yeah. And they'd make, um, and when they did the courts in the back, they'd make a little social. Rosamund Whiteside would come out with cookies and whatnot. And when they had little tournaments there, and exhibitions. Yeah. And there were quite a few well, it was just a community tennis club until Rivia Manor broke off. Those fellows felt the need of not walking all the way down the hill and back again. They, not many came down in cars in those days. They didn't have them. And they uh, they formed the Manor Club in 1918, which was an offshoot of the Tower Jack Club crowd. Oh, then when did you suppose the, tower, the tennis courts were built down below the Tower Ridge? Well, you see, uh, they go back to the far and near tennis club which was formed about 1885. It was there in the, at the corner of Tompkins Square in the old Handy House. That mm -hmm. was a tennis club. But they're now tearing up. It's now tearing up, yeah. And in that uh, building there, um, the people gathered in the first year for the formation of the Tower Jack Club and the Riverfront mm -hmm. Clubhouse itself. And so there was a gap in tennis from the time the far and near quit 1895, and they sold the house. Mm -hmm. Most of its members moved into the then established Arzy Club, the wealthier mm -hmm. members who came up from New York and the Tally Hose and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, went up to Arsley. So there was a gap in from 1895 and about 1907. And then the 19th, about the late part of that decade when they built the two courts on Riverview Place. Mm -hmm. Living next door, and he guys, I was a tennis ball, and I had a racket in my hand when I was about four years old, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, you actually remember when they constructed the courts down there? Yeah, vaguely can recall yeah. the 19, the Riverview Place courts, but I know the other courts. The other courts came in about 1914 or 15. The uh, upper courts were done built first, and then the lower Yeah, the lower courts, yeah. Did that actually require membership in the club? It, was it required membership in the yacht club. Mm -hmm. It used to call it the tennis crowd. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, a, in the slim years, they say the tennis crowd was carrying the yacht club, particularly right after Fourth and Hastings built a dock around the yacht club, yeah. and things got kind of sour there after that nasty old dock. Well, you you spent, how much of your life did you spend down the roof you played? I was there until, uh, Married in 1941. Until then, until 1941. So I uh, knew the north end of the village very well. Yeah. Well, maybe you can tell tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up in oh. Tower Ridge because that's an old section of Hastings. Let me give you a few little personal uh, situation. Um, Tower Ridge was well, as I say, Ridge Place was included in Tower Ridge and. There were a lot of kids over in Tower Ridge, and we used to use the north end of Maple Avenue as sort of a baseball diamond, athletic field, and everything else, much to the consummation of the uh, 
disgust of some of the neighbors there because uh, you can't be hitting balls around or playing underleg. You just toss the ball in the lake or underleg. You didn't have a batter. You just throw the ball underneath your leg and yeah. then ran it against your fielders and try to run around with the team. But um, that was the old gang. We used to gather down the end of Edmarth Place and all pool our fireworks to, and have a regular program to on the pole that was there, just as, as you went down the air clubs, where someone would have a, a pinwheel, so then I would fire a skyrocket. I had a regular program, about six or seven families of kids and the people would come down and watch this stuff <laughs> after dark and without their ordinary restrictions in those days, yeah. fireworks. Um, I remember as a kid, my first job was going up into the Zinza Brook and gathering watercress that uh, the people the people adjacent to us on the right were named Krieger, Samuel G. Krieger. He had been a retired department store owner from New Orleans. And they used to pay me, I think, a nickel a bunch. And I'd go up maybe once, or maybe twice a week, I forget. But they liked watercress. I, I did that for a while. And my next job was um, getting milk for them. I used to go up every other day to Shaw's Estate, where they had about two to three cows and uh, took a bucket, this wasn't pasteurized milk, mm -hmm. and went down behind Shores Estate, down to the, they had a sort of a garage and mm -hmm. also a barn down the, yeah. behind toward the railroad track, so mm -hmm. threw that back in there and get a pail of milk. It wasn't too heavy, it was heavy enough for about a 10 or 11 year old kid. How many cows did you have? They had three or two or three, maybe four, I'm not sure, and they passed, uh, their pasture was where the north end of the River Glen is today. Okay. Just above where Shore, where okay. uh, it was, was no man's land, Shore owned the property there. Uh, and I think I got something like 15 cents a, a run for that. But that, that was the best part of a half mile up and back, I guess, more than more than that. And of course, winter time, you shovel snow and Remember, let's see, I was 12 years old, 1917, the worst, one of the worst falls we ever had, winter falls, and I, the going rate as a shovel was 25 cents an hour. And I remember presenting a bill to the C.C. Parsons, who lived in the original McGee house opposite the living area place, $14, I'll never forget that. They went down to live in, the, uh, in the apartment in New York. and. Uh, they, were, they, were, they couldn't believe it. I shoveled 14 dollars worth of snow. There was all those hours in there, four hours for a dollar. But I had to shovel the, the walk that went between uh, Riviera Place and Maple Avenue, mm -hmm. and shovel their stoop and everything else. And, uh, oh, so they weren't living there during the winter? They were out in the winter. They, were, they just had to believe me. I don't know, forget that I'm raising a question. I was, I was getting mad because I, I really had down the book. The snowstorm, how many hours? <laughs> were there many other families like that that just summered here that you remember? The manor crowd, a lot of the people and years ago would rent their houses here and go up to the White Mountains and the Green Mountains, the Adirondacks, mm -hmm. and rent their houses. To who? To city people? To city people. Yeah. And the people next door to us, I don't know why they went to Kriegers, but they would rent to people at times. Mm -hmm. uh, Whitesides uh, had their first car, about 19, they had their first car on the block. Walker Whiteside, the actor, about 1910, I guess. And all people had cars, most people had cars then were fairly wealthy, I think, because they had chauffeurs. He had a chauffeur. Mm -hmm. Which house did the white side of They were on the river, the, on the north side, and one of the three houses that Commodore Ross built. Mm -hmm. The big house on the south side was built by an author, Frederick U. Adams, mm -hmm. Upham Adams, Frederick Upham Adams. And Riviera Place was washed out, a terrific storm that washed it right down across the track. Mm -hmm. Stopped trains for several hours. Mm -hmm. And with that, um, the uh, I don't know, DPW or whoever contributed to it, decided they better do something. And it was just about during Broadway on the permit uh, by 1999, 1910, mm -hmm. with the Hastings Pavement Block. Mm -hmm. So they did 
with your place too. They put, put those culverts and took that stream down mm -hmm. underneath the tennis court down into what is, what is River Glen, mm -hmm. the Glen there. It went out that way. Were the tennis courts below there at that time? There weren't any courts below there, the courts were on top. The only, oh, on top. River Glen built a court oh. uh, down below. Right, all right. Uh, so, for right. a while, and uh, people use it. I don't know if it's still there or not. But that was a, a terrific washout. And uh, I can remember as a kid, couldn't climb the, the size of the hole. The depth it was, it seemed to me, about six feet wide. It just it washed the whole street out. Was it after a, a, a severe like storm? The spring with the after the snow, or is it just a rain? I storm? think it was spring, but it was just about before they were going to pave Broadway. So it must have been about 1909, because I have a, I think 1910 was a paving of Broadway, and that street, people paid to have that street paved. They paid the oh, really? private state. The only were assessed to have it, the, the uh, payment company did it along with the village contract, mm -hmm. but they had to pay for it, and they paid for those hexagonal block sidewalks, mm -hmm. some of which you still see today. Sure. Well, these were, these were, this was done on a, the uh, people in different parts of the village who might have a little job done. Alan Place was a man who worked in the payment company. McCullough? McCullough. Sure. Uncle yeah. Nick. Yeah. So, um, let's see, where do you want to go from there? Do you remember anything about the horse and buggies that you used to, when you were a little boy? Were there? Broadway was a, from, um, from the square north was a sort of a raceway where there would uh, as uh, Albert Shaw said, they used to race their pony carts up and down there. Uh, horses and uh, their rigs. There were, there were a few people that had, I think, Wardy Tompkins that had a, um, had a rig. What do you call them? A harness type uh, mm -hmm. rig. And then he, he and my dad used to stay to race my dad on a bicycle on a big white spot mm -hmm. at uh, 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 bike where he, or the racing bike. He, in fact, he, one of his side jobs was selling Remington bikes. Mm -hmm. He used to have pearl handles on okay. those days go for about hundred dollars, which was an awful lot of money. Yeah. But he, uh, I don't know who won. I think Dad beat him. Maybe the horse beat Pop, but usually Pop said he beat uh, yeah. Woody Tompkins. Of course, and he could give you a good imitation of how they used to go, but I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was quite a. It was a flat strip and known as a uh, sort of a raceway there. Uh, for one mile by the hill. Start just to, uh, before the rise, and, and uh, it was flat all the way up to Livingston Manor there. Uh, the Orlando J. Smith estate, uh, just below the McKinsey School. There was a McKinsey School in the day. Yeah. Where was that? Where the missionary sisters say, oh. all right, we're going to bring you home. And, oh, uh, yeah. It's a famous private school, McKinsey School. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Did they use the same building for the missionary? Uh, the old yellow brick building. But did many people, do you remember at the point when you were a child, but did many individuals have horse and buggy rigs to, to get around town, or had they already fought? Well, they did, but do you see, the, 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 you get the, uh, when the people came to the, this was a commuting crowd that came to Tower Ridge. They weren't built for any auxiliary buildings. You had to have an auxiliary building for a horse. Mm. Uh, and the Riverview Place the same way. They didn't even have garages, the first three, five buildings that, Come to Ross, put up the rod in garages. Mm -hmm. And uh, building that had a garage was the one that the big house built by 1915. That beautiful tile building, mm -hmm. the house there, yeah. where I forget who's in it now. But that had a garage separate for no horses. The horses were in your states. Well, how would you get across town, across county, for instance? Well, if you want to go to Rye Beach, you take uh, the train to Terrytown. Uh, as we did as mm -hmm. kids, uh, or usually uh, folks, mm -hmm. train to Terry Town, trolley to White Plains, and then get on the White the Rye Beach trolley at White Plains. It went down to the oh. Neck and over that way. So you could get to White Plains by going to Terry Town. Or uh, there was an early so. bus route to Terry Town, one of the first bus routes uh, between Hastings and Terry Town. That bus route, I forget what year it started, but uh, it's trying to see if you could do it that way. Or if you want to go a long way around, you went down and took the trolley to Yonkers. Mm -hmm. And uh, went over to Yonkers to New Rochelle or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. There was ways of doing it. Yeah. But, uh, 
Do you see, there was uh, around 1910, there were, the manor was just opening up. Uh, Locust Hill had opened up uh, a couple of years before that. There wasn't any pine crest. Uh, so all your the residential area was confined to near where there was transportation. Mm -hmm. And we used to like on Riviera Place, we were near the post office. When you got cars, you could always get, you would never left the car out. Yeah. Sleep. That was uh, uh, treason almost to your, to your neighbor. You uh, always put your car away. In fact, we used to keep our car down the line's garage for years. But it was unsightly considered that? Unsightly, yeah. yeah. And also, it damaged the car. Whether well, it damaged the car. Right. If yeah. you can call it damaging the car. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll never forget Judge Beavis. One night there was a, well, this was in the, in the, in the 30s, early 30s. I used to take him home from the court when I was reporting. And, uh, oh, I just quit reporting. And, uh, there was a drive on an overnight parking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got down late in this court, court that night. It must have been about 25 people before me. Mm -hmm. And the judge uh, looked at me and said, Guilty? I said, well, yes, you know, uh, Judge, I happened to leave it out that night for a reason, uh, there was an explanation. And uh, I was still keeping my car in the lines to ride. So that'll be a dollar. I then I fell over. <laughs> I used to keep take him home every night, practically. Every time he held court, I'd take him home to Ferguson. <laughs> I thought I said, well, that's a suspended sentence. <laughs> you know, everyone else had been out. They had yeah. cleaned the deck, so they only had the last one to come in. I apologize for being late. <laughs> Did you went to uh, school. Where did you first go to school? Well, I went to kindergarten here. My, my Which school was happened by Farragut School? I may have, uh, yeah, kindergarten and Farragut School, and my later-to-be aunt was, um, Miss Frieda Schaefer was the kindergarten teacher. She mm -hmm. married my uncle. I don't know if there was any connection there or not, but about a year later. Was that, that, that was in the, right on Farragut? That was a big school. It opened in 1904, and right. I, uh, this is now 19... Ten when I went to school. Yeah. And, um, what sort of? How long was the school day? What time? Well, the school day? day was two sessions. You went up there in the morning. Now, on kindergarten, I can't recall whether it was a single session or not. But I remember my grandmother walked me to school many times, mm -hmm. and we had a big collie, and the collie would come along mm -hmm. too. And the collie was hit in front of Henry's print shop oh, one time. Yeah. Fortunately, with a, I'll never forget the guy now stopping driving that stop and this is a big door. But the cars, the old cars were so high off the ground and just spun around to a hold of the neck that he just recovered himself. There were yeah. vets around with that either. Yeah. But the um, and the schools uh, say that up to that time I think some of the people were still going down on uh, the Main Street school. A grades a couple of grades were going down. They're the hook and ladder is now. Well, I went through the grammar school and skipped a half a grade here and a half a grade there. So I was about 12 years, 12 years old when I got through grammar school. And uh, I, I still recall the old teachers like Mary Dunbar and people who, Millie Fredericks has pictures of these. I've got some pictures yeah. of this school. Well, how large were the classes? Classes seem to me about 25 to 30 kids. Now mm -hmm. I can show you some pictures of them down here. Yeah, we I do recall in wintertime, though, that we uh, would take, I must have been maybe 10, 11, 12 then, we'd take our slaves to school mm -hmm. and just park them outside and put them in a snow, stand them up and come out and get the mm -hmm. sleigh and get down and I can make home and review a place in no time. So, down for a very little traffic, you did have the streetcar, mm -hmm. but uh, if you watch that, you will, so many kids were around, they were watching people and being dangerous lots. So, yeah. oh, and so I could write down by Henry, it almost made the mole there yeah. by the Hastings Terrace, but I think we walked about you know, 50, 25 yards, something like that, and slow us right down again and go on home. Did you generally take a bicycle during the spring? No, I never rode a bike. The bikes were... Were, uh, were very few bicycles being ridden out to when I was a kid. It seemed to me. Mm -hmm. Well, my dad had four hanging in the attic, and he gave me one. There was an old timer that no coaster break on or anything like that. Yeah. You know, put your, the coach had to put your 
feet up in the fork of the uh, one around the oh yeah the, the, below the handlebars. Mm -hmm. the the when do you remember cars just first coming into vogue? More and more cars, oh, people, more individuals having cars rather than just the isolated cars. I would say uh, in the twenties. Early 20s. Mm -hmm. My dad, for instance, had a Model T in about 1918, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a salesman, and he used to, to go out with him on mm -hmm. trips. And it used to be quite a trip to go up to Newburgh with him and stuff like that. Do you remember uh, the winter sports you used to do when you were a kid? Well, sleigh riding was the greatest sport in town. Such a thing as skiing, and never saw a pair of skis. Mm -hmm. uh, your best run for uh, this side of town was the Lard Hill. If you wanted to get fancy, you went up to around Circle Drive. But you'd lose an awful lot of speed going around the pump house of Circle Drive mm -hmm. down into right. Villard. Because by the time you were coming down to Villard, you were making a terrific amount of speed while you're trying to pass the pump house. How would you break it? Break the speed? You'd break, it with, break it with your... Well, we, we swung into Broadway. Usually with people there at Broadway, that would... Uh, the, bunch, the kids came down usually four or five together. Mm -hmm. And would, if there were any cars, this would be, you know, say, on 1920, I'd be 15. Mm -hmm. That'd be about the height of my, or 16, about the height of my uh, uh, sleigh riding. Mm -hmm. I did have one experience, though. I came down, and I'll forget, uh, I, usually I was a long-legged kid, so I took, I had my own sleigh. Mm -hmm. Never liked anyone riding behind. I had a high sleigh. Mm -hmm. And this day, he didn't have a sleigh, and my friend was Courtney Wilkie. Mm -hmm. And Courtney got on behind, and we got coming down pretty fast. And when it came to get to take the curve at Broadway, um, I couldn't break it. I don't think he was breaking. He was just hanging on behind. Mm -hmm. I was breaking. I couldn't break it hard enough. And we went over, and we hit the pole mm -hmm. in front of what is now Dr. Uh, Roll's place. Right. And in those days, uh, the Wiggins lived there. Mm -hmm. And Mother was in a bridge group. There were four tables of bridge, and they were playing bridge. These women were playing right in the bridge. House, in the house. house. And they came outside. They saw a crowd around these two kids, and they came outside, and there was my mother <laughs> looking out at the sun with a little blood coming off his forehead or something like that. <laughs> the sleigh all smashed up. <laughs> she got scared for a minute. I didn't, I, I didn't remember what Mother was in the place, but I certainly did. <laughs> How, how wide was the Broadway at that time? How wide was Broadway? Mm -hmm. Broadway was about as wide as this day, but it was crowned. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, when you went around the corner, you had to get down in that gutter mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and use the crown of the road mm -hmm. to keep you on the right. right hand side because you went down past your house. Because yeah. if you were at West Junction, it was bad there, but you could see cars coming north on Broadway. Reynolds had a hedge you couldn't see yeah. much there, but the, the kids would let you know we were down there. But the, the bad junction was the next one, Townsend Square, because there was a bus line running in, and there were more cars coming on Warburton Air. Broadway wasn't paved. Oh, it wasn't paved. It was not paved. It was asphalt and, and gravel and so on. Broadway wasn't paved until about 1929, I think, when they finally the big paving project. And I, I may be wrong. It didn't ever have a block pavement on it, so it was asphalt. When they paved, when they did the first paving, they paved Broadway, North Broadway, and then ran down Warburton Avenue, mm -hmm. and came up around the Handy House. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Handy didn't like to, when they went up around the Handy House, they raised the grade a little bit, mm -hmm. and they paved this in front of his house with hexagonal blocks, the thick, thick, mm -hmm. and he served the village for that. Well, I know Dr. Dorff was furious with the, uh, uh, with the state at the time, too, because they took away some of his front yard. He battled them on that. When they were widened it for the, for the concrete paving yeah. in about 19, what was the year was that? Well, the house was built in 1918, right after the war, so I don't know what Well, I don't think they took anything out of it from him, but they wouldn't have, uh, Lyman was there across the way. Well, according to his daughter, that, that he was pretty furious about it, I once asked her why this, there was no sidewalk on Elm, and she, she said he was so furious with because he lost the battle with the stain on taking away lawn, the, his front lawn that he, he buried the sidewalk on Elm Place. It may have been, uh, I guess you're right, it couldn't have been, I'd say it would be, be about three-quarters of the way through mm. the day, but it was, a, it was crowned. Yeah. 
I mean, it wasn't wasn't deep mm -hmm. uh, like Sheldon Place had down here. But, uh, Do you remember it being like very dusty before they paved it? Was it in the summer? I can't remember. The, uh, I have a vague recollection of the water wagon. I remember the water wagon, as I recall, was used for health purposes one summer when there was a terrific water shortage. Right? Yeah. Just to be water that way. Everyone, um, yeah, I think people went up with their pails to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Every uh, people knew the brooks in town, and uh, there was a spring on the Zinza property, and they let a lot of people use their spring. There was a spring further up or on Edgar Lane. I think that was the same water or a spring nearby mm -hmm. down through the yeah. Zinza property. Well, it was it associated with the brook that went through the Zinza property right. and so on? And uh, okay. it was, it was a, about 19. Well, I think, or in about there. It was just one bit of water shortage. And the, the roads, you now Broadway must have been paved, as I think, in the 1990. Maybe it was before that. Maybe it was about 1910. Uh, but there was, a, it was, it was uh, something that they, they thought about. Yeah. And uh, the water, uh, one of the stories that should be told with research, it can be. Uh, mm -hmm. I bet that Fredericks, uh, my friend Millie Fredericks, knows that story. I have several stories I want to ask her. Mm -hmm. the, old, the, the, the railroad wreck down here was a little tragedy. Yeah. But the, the point, the whole point is about that. My well, dad, sometimes probably you take this and sit down and get some Yeah, my story. dad uh, remembers running out of the house. So it must have been after 1890. He heard the wreck. Although the brakeman came down, the, the story I can recall in this brief was that he told me the brakeman came down from the train that was still up there for some reason, up the mm -hmm. curve. Just the way around the curve, I guess. So, so that would be in Dallas Ferry, but the train ahead of it would probably be in the east. Mm -hmm. And then um, he had this, whatever lights he had that meant something, red and white, and he put them on the next train up was supposed to be a local. And he put them on, and there was only three tracks there, and this was in Spain. Mm -hmm. There were two of them. No, there must have three because it's said that. So the uh, next train up, the guy who brake went on across the street into the bar and grill in the National Hotel, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, Another express came by. I was on the middle track. It's nice and severe. This one up here. I don't know how many are killed. I was going to ask New York Central to see what they've got on it. And the guy, the brakeman, he took off. They didn't find him for <laughs> several days later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah. Well, that's it. The White Sides, when they came to town, they tell a, a story of living. They were moving into the rented house, the familiar place, the one they were going to rent, but they stayed in the hotel across the way. There were two hotels Ooh. that night. And Where was it? The hotel on the east side of the tracks. Oh. I've been thinking of a I Remember When series that we, we should probably send out to all the old time members and ask them to do an I Remember When, whatever they we can contribute. You know, you mean like a group of people sitting around? We've got two or three of them. Well, no, just put it down. What mm -hmm. they remember. Uh, Mrs. Rich told me uh, the other day of some things. Of uh, course, you go to funerals, you hear okay. that. And you saw the picture we got. Mm -hmm. yeah. And went down to Andrews. Mm -hmm. a, uh, uh, Miss, Mrs. Bracken, who's McFarland's mm -hmm. sister, mm -hmm. said that she was a secretary to Zinzer. Mm -hmm. And uh, almost confidential secretary. Mm -hmm. when the, the wedding of Peggy Zinzer to Douglas mm -hmm. was, uh, I think, in 1918, and there was a garden wedding, and mm -hmm. they went out underneath a big tree down there and had it that way. An ox was on the porch, and uh, they were there at the wedding and went to more or less personal things for the Zinzers. Mm -hmm. Well, there's Mrs. Bracken down there. We ought to get a hold of her. Uh, so just, just by all the blue talk to me the other night. we got to get a list of all these people. So we can start Kevin has a list of the ones we start them out with. Like I had Scully and Edith Schutz and people like that. And, and Duddies. And, uh, we ought to get the full thing back. Okay. Yeah. Does he have anything else beyond that list? I don't know. That's his coach. I suppose to be in the business. Tell me about in summers. What, what did you do in your vacations? Like, you know, as early well, as I can remember. We didn't have any money. You know. We were a family without much. Mm -hmm. We were scraping around for. Uh, we used to pay the the uh, the uh, coal dealers of Richmond, the old Tampa dealers. Mother would run, pay them 
five dollars a month. Or if they had ten ton of coal, that was fifty dollars, and she paid on the installment plan. And, uh, if your credit was good, that was great. And the fellow by the name of Letty, Jim Letty, came with Hudson River Yards. My mother started to pay the five dollars a month, and he said, "Oh no, we can't go go for that." And uh, I said, well, tell me if a baby's always let, let us do it, and uh, if you don't want the business, I, I, I don't know if these are her words in that case, but uh, he later also fell in the pattern of that he was letting good customers that, that, that they knew that he was going to get the money and pay that way. Um, let me just uh, come back to the, to the uh, summer work. I did some summer work down here, but in the days when I was a kid, and people you said how they how they live or they how they couldn't get things they didn't have some of them a lot of the tower rich people I don't think there were any of the tower rich people had cars a lot of the tower ridges who came up say around 1900 and the manor developed moved up the manor the Shreves mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of them have been tower rich the Shreves the architect the architect mm -hmm. um, see they were rented. Those mm -hmm. cottages were rented until the war, the mm -hmm. first World War, World War, World War. Mm -hmm. and then uh, that's when, after the war, prices were inflation set in. Mm -hmm. That's when Hastings unloaded all his houses. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's what that's what uh, Ross did. Mm -hmm. We rented from Ross, and he unloaded, and he won to pay off for his house. Yeah. Um, the grocery stores would send out a a morning man, like one of the dailies, Justin Daly is still living. He was, he was one of the fellows go around from B.F. Tampkins. Mm -hmm. Bert Tampkins had a store next to the Protection Hall. He had a big grocery store. Was that Grace Miles or the other one? Uh, no, right. Protection. Right, that's there right. Was a, there was a private house, and you know, people mm -hmm. in here read lived South Protection, if you know, almost at the time of. Well, through the 30s, through the 30s, I guess. That would be just where Smallhouse's uh, place is now, then? Yeah. In Smallhouse's place was, as I recall, that was a store on the north side of it was the Hastings News mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Well, I know Mr. Smallhouse had told me there's a print, printing press there. Well, I think they later press. took, I think they later moved into that side, too, and took yeah. the whole thing out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but in a, I know that they were either, in my recollection is that, until so Tompkins went out of business, but the, he was on the south side and the press was on the north side, right. and then later they took over the whole thing. Right. Well, you know. anyway, um, you'd best place your order with a boy, mm -hmm. and then you get an afternoon delivery in horse and wagon. You mean he would go around from house to he'd house? He'd go around from house to house. You see, you only had, your perimeter was of your thickly populated area, was your uh, review place, mm home -hmm. place, or some houses. Of, mm -hmm. There was still some waiting lots of known place, yeah. and a Fraser Place. Yeah. Fraser Place and nothing uh, up to Lard Avenue, maybe two or three houses in, mm -hmm. or half a dozen houses up to the Spite House, mm -hmm. and so on. So they were close to the village, but these fellows went around and got their orders mm -hmm. and, uh, and delivered, and you had fewer. Did they walk around to get to the They'd walk around, and then they come back with the back horse. horse and buggy. Right. Uh, there were a couple of Yonkers firms, Acker, Merrill, and Cundit, a famous firm there, mm -hmm. and, and uh, where the Yonkers post office is. They could send the uh, firm, to send the, yeah. well, those people had telephones, the telephone mm -hmm. orders in, and they sent them out. But telephones about 1910, 1915, 15, 15 or 20. They were, no, they were, it was very seldom a person didn't have a telephone. By 1915. Right. I have a 1914 book, and it shows most of the people that they yeah. When do you suppose the first came to Hastings telephone? Well, now you're getting something I should know better. Uh, I think it was a pay station in, in Todd's drugstore about 1890. Mm -hmm. I've got the telephone history. Yeah. Uh, it came to Yonkers about 1884. Mm -hmm. There may have been one or two telephones, and I just got it back, and I was like, I should verify it. And how about electricity? When did you suppose that first came apart? Well, we got the franchise from Con Edison. I was trying to do a story on transport on uh, utilities here. But the next story I'll do will be on transportation. Um, about 1887. And uh, before that, there was gas. Gas was here, and they had that car. 1879 or 1880 map shows the Abbotsford Gas Works. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there were gas lamps. 
in the village. I think the first in the depot plaza, which is down at the foot of the hill, uh, and I think we have a picture of it, shows uh, about four lights in a cluster, electric lights in a cluster, and that picture was taken during days of steam, mm -hmm. about 1900, I think. So, uh, uh, the mechanical water, uh, they can't give me any back in mechanical water. What's the nearest shell? I call them up over there and call the people and talk to the, the local chemical branch. We've had a water, I think, since about 1895. I'm not sure, 1900. But I better research that a little bit. So you mentioned that you had that one big gro what was the name of the grocery store? I'm sorry. Uh, in Hastings. Next, in Hastings, next to the. We have Tompkins had a store. What other stores do you remember? Well, according to uh, um, Lois Clark Murphy. Uh, Joe Murphy had a store, had a nice store there on um, Warburton Avenue. And there was a store on me, and I think he later moved to me, so I'm not sure about this. See, now that's one of the Murphy girls is still living. Yeah. I don't get what give us this stuff. Yeah, all these little things. Really. Um, but the fellow Ann Miller had a big store on Main Street. Grocery store. Grocery store. Uh, I think Joe Murphy was a clerk in his store, I'm not sure. Those. Early editions of the Half Moon make reference to the store. The oh, big okay. store, central store, about 1890, before Tompkins and Murphy and these folks had any store, there was a Dorland store, yeah. corner of Warburton and Spring, mm -hmm. and there was a meeting hall up above. A lot of those organizations got yeah. started there. And the post office got started there, you know? The Vedas was pretty Well, see, Vedas came up with uh, when the Divine Bill was 1916, I think, we put this hall there. He took away the graduations that used to be down in the protection hall, and the functions moved to the vines hall. It was more uh, the stairs were uh, it was a better, more accommodation, bigger. Mm -hmm. And they put on the uh, women's club put on that famous Mikado mm -hmm. production, Gilbert Sullivan's Mikado there. I remember being up with Mr. Whiteside, who was the director behind the lights. Mm -hmm. He had a big spotlight, and he was up there on the uh, like over the. Stairway came up in the little, uh, like a room or platform, but the stairway up there. And well, I the Divine's there garage. Hmm? In Divine's, uh, the Divine's garage. So that's, I guess, my father-in-law and his father used to work in those too. Yeah. I guess the whole. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. They used to. Heavy. Mother, my mother played the piano for a lot of these things, uh, and the Tyra Jack would be put on minstrel. They put on a beautiful minstrel show, and they all their functions were in um, protection hall. But then later, they moved. well, I guess by that time, the, you see what killed the club around 1916, right? That's what this poster of Hastings building the document. Yeah. That's a sad story in all the winter. But uh, this document was in our minutes of the club. Mm -hmm. but, uh, he got That's access, right. he got the Parian rights mm -hmm. from his mother in law. His mother, his mother in law, apparently gave the club the document. Mm -hmm. so he got the Parian rights included, and, and the club was included on that, in that Harvard section. He built the uh, the stock and brought up raw garbage from New York, and that way, don't you think, there was a stench from the garbage and a stench in the village, the his pond was terrific. Uh, people like Adams just built that beautiful house at the foot of Riverview Place, and the Tyrage people themselves. It was one of the worst uh, health conditions ever Why they allow the village. It? Stop well, they couldn't stop from building, I suppose, to cover it. They, they did put the cinders on it finally, but here they were coming up with raw garbage from the city. And the uh, health, uh, the only health put a ban on, put a ban on swimming, right? Because of that. They're mm -hmm. swimming in Hastings and Cindy. Dobbs Ray was still swimming on their docks in Dobbs Ray. Of course, the river got gradually polluted, and yeah. it got yeah. more people moving in, and the sewage went into the river. They didn't have the intercepting trunk line sewer until 1927. You asked me a story before, it ever worked around the plants here. Mm -hmm. uh, first uh, thing I remember about the plants were, you see now the tracks are in there. The electrified tracks, we have four tracks. When when did the electrified tracks come in? About 19, you'll notice all the uh, little indentations, 19.9 on the, on the uh, station and mm -hmm. so on, and the, all the concrete and installations, 19.9, so about 19.9. That early is the electrified The electrified trains came to the yeah, third rail. As far as we're from, 19.9. That's early. Um, 
Yeah, well, it stood up for a while for, for years. You know, they were good friends. Well, the, um, my dad was wandering around back about 1914 and working for the Packard Company, the motor trucks. And he was a salesman? Yeah. He got a job down in the carry him over there. He got a job in the Hastings Pavement Company as a wear mm -hmm. from these ships of asphalt that come up. In Trinidad, was that? In Trinidad, yeah. And uh, that was the main store. These were regular steamships. They were in those days. And um, the bucket would go down, bring up the asphalt, and dump it in this big vat mm -hmm. almost. Uh, a funnel, and that would give you the, when the odd stuff went in there, the, and he was there. I used to go up and take a lunch down to him. I'd go up to the, the uh, ladders. It was like as though the whole place was going to shit. <laughs> yeah. I'd drop down in a minute and sh shiver, you know, and all this stuff was, was a tremendous roar. Yeah. You know? And that's the way, of course, they got the mixture, other mixture up through that way. And I wait, and then they went down a little cart after you. You got a full cart or whatever the weight was you were supposed to let it down. It went down about 150 yards or whatever the line it was to the yard. Mm -hmm. And then down at the mixing plant, they pressed out the, brick, or the bricks mm -hmm. or the blocks, and the blocks were stored there. Mm -hmm. You've got the story about how they were shipping blocks all over the country. Mm -hmm. It was a, a uh, it had a, one of the biggest customers was New York City. Oh, really? An awful lot of streets that you can still see on the upper around Riverside Drive that go into Riverside Drive, small streets. You see the blocks down there. Hmm. Uh, most of them have been covered by asphalt. How many men are you supposed to have paid the company? I don't uh, know. That wasn't a big payroll. Uh, in fact, uh, Mrs. Salmon, who was always in Yonkers, was hoping that the chief chemist could tell us. I'd say about 75. Really? Yeah. I don't. There is, they seem to be busy at times. See, when they got a contract, they usually got subcontracts until they the bricks, mm -hmm. as I recall. Oh, they were responsible for laying the bricks? They would lay the bricks, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. They were well, I remember when they laid the bricks on um, Broadway. They first laid the bricks on Broadway, I think about, and they did Farragut in. Now, that must have been about 1919 when they took off the trolley. Mm -hmm. That's what happened, I guess. Uh, but I can remember laying the bricks on Broadway. Not curb to curb, but about 20 feet wide, mm -hmm. and they made their own curves, and then there was a little asphalt to the curb, mm -hmm. to the other curb, to the side. But they made a narrow road of brick uh, blocks there, and then they took the narrow road all the way up to, um, to Uniontown. Did they have any preparation okay. prior to the block, any cinders underneath the block? Oh yeah, you'd have a you'd have a concrete base. Oh, concrete base. Of um, depending on what sort of road you wanted. Mm -hmm. Now the first roads they put in were about four inches of concrete. Of concrete. The underneath that? No, well, whatever they had. I guess the, the city, they had the roads there, and the roads were cracked. But they were packed down themselves. Mm -hmm. So right on top of the existing road, they put. Well, I think they scraped them. I mean, scraped they, them, they, but they then made they put even. concrete. And they'd put concrete, and then you'd put, then you'd put a layer of sand. Yeah. And then as you put the block down, you put a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, tar in between the blocks. Oh, they, they were tarred together. They were tarred together. Oh, they weren't just dry packed the way they are, like in their own place. No, they were tarred. Well, the tar was in there. Yeah. Uh, they, were, they were tarred. I remember the tar, the, the tar, um, they had a little fire in it. Mm -hmm. Sure. The tar uh, cart would go along with them. And they would they set the blocks a, individually, though? Mm -hmm. they I'll set, set the blocks individually. And they tar it like they put, like they take a brick, like instead of putting mortar on the brick, they put tar on the brick and then set it in place? No, so they, they set the blocks first, as I recall. They, 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 take, the, they take their sand, yeah. and uh, the, the layer of sand was very fine sand on top of the, of the concrete. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can recall the guys even having sand and throwing sand underneath mm -hmm. it sometimes. And uh, most of them were or darkies, they had these big strong guys with big backs and mm -hmm. it was back mm -hmm. to keep leaning over. Mm -hmm. They'd be fed with two or three feeders mm -hmm. coming up from the, taking the stuff from the trucks and of course, and I, don't know, I think they had little dollies there. Bring them up and then uh, to the guys who were dropping them, the fellows would come up hand feed them from maybe six feet behind them mm -hmm. and keep, keep blocks alongside them all the time. Right. So these guys can keep on laying. But how did the tar get on it? How'd and then the fellows, after they got off, after they were further ahead, uh, I 
can't recall now, maybe eleven feet high. This may, may not be accurate, but I uh, know they used to have the tar with their... Oh, they just put the tar in between In between, the yeah. In between. So they leave the space between each block and then they... No, they didn't leave any space, but there would be, the space would be between the blocks. You see, the blocks didn't, uh, might be just a sixteenth or a sixty-fourth of an inch. And they just put it on the surface just then? Just put, put it on the... Uh, oh, so it wasn't completely tar surface, mm -hmm. but they just, I, as I thought, there was a very thin bead. Uh, like the warning can with a, 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 a very narrow snout on it. Was it snoop snout? Yeah. <laughs> But like this, because down here with it with your tar. Yeah, I understand. I wasn't sure if they actually put it underneath it and made a bed of it. The way oh, no, no, it wasn't that. No, it was just the same on the yeah. So it was fused together, the, essentially. Yeah, just a, it was like an adhesive. Mm. Um, maybe, they, maybe they skipped it some places. Maybe they didn't need to. Uh, places were going over a hill. Traction for cars mm. had to get on down spray hill. You know, the church sure. there. I don't know about the hill there by uh, Hastings Terrace, but they'd leave a space about all oh, three eighths of an inch or almost a half an inch between the blocks so they could put cement oh. in there. Oh. And that would give traction yeah. to the car. And what you had later on, you see, when the trucks came and they, they were torn up, the streets were torn up for uh, utilities and whatnot, mm -hmm. four inches of concrete wasn't sustaining the trucks properly, mm -hmm. and you were getting an awful roll, so when you repaved, I remember, I think, it was a 1929 repaving of Warburton Annual and Broadway. Yeah. They didn't repave, uh, uh, they went right up the Dodge Spray line, the Irvin line, with a double contract, Dodge Spray and Houston. They made an eight-inch base, uh, and then you had a two-inch top with a block, so you had a ten-inch pavement. They still used the block there. They used the block on that. That was the last big contract, I think. Uh, I wonder why they didn't leave the concrete as a surface. Well, in fact, you got a local pavement company yeah. here, and you had a yeah. doggone good politician who was a, yeah. one of the village leaders, and he was a well known. He used to say this fellow, George P. M. Street, knew his way around as, a, as, a, <laughs> yeah. as an entertaining a general manager. He goes, he got, they used to say, New York City in his back pocket. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they did an awful lot of parks for blocks. Yeah. And they actually kept them in business, even after fire. I understand they're still in existence, but only out someplace else now. Well, they, their big plant was in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Where well, that ever happened to them, I don't know. So I told me this, they saw something out in the on the Hastings Paving Company. Yeah, I think you mentioned that yeah, in the meeting. Yeah. Well, that was the Hastings Paving Company, and that the yard was, I think they used mules around the yard to pull the truck. To the I worked myself in the uh, during the summer, one summer, the American Brass Company, and uh, for at the carpenter shop. I think Frank was there in those days. This is the summer of 1925. Yeah. They told me they were giving me more than the usual uh, uh, pay. Uh, usually, people got 40 cents an hour when they started, and we were getting other collegian and myself, Frank Moke from RPI. We were getting 42 and a half cents an hour to make these wheels. Like six footers or four footers, and, and uh, it was a uh, 55 hour week, an hour day. You started work at seven in the morning, and you whistle blew, or more whistles blew. Yeah. Because the pavement company started about the same time, and they blew a whistle. And we'd have a five and a seven whistle, and a seven o'clock whistle. And then um, one would be two whistles. I think it gets to work, uh, whistle was two whistles. And Zinza would start eight o'clock, and then have whistles there. Uh, just to aggravate me, uh, uh, not aggravate me, but envy uh, me. Uh, I was envy to see these commuters getting on trains at 8 o'clock, and we've already done a few day, uh, an hour's hour work, you know. Sure. And then we worked, we went home for lunch, and we came back at 1, and we went from 1 to 6. Where were you going to school that time? I was going to uh, Syracuse. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I worked on a paper, I worked on the Yonkers Herald and the Yonkers mm -hmm. Statesman. Uh, so how Herald old were you going to school? When I was down the plant here, I was 18, I think. When I was 19. Um, so the story about the plant, I don't know if this is, of course, you're going to get this tape. One uh, a fellow by the name of Ralph Day was the general manager. And the insulating department was uh, just next to the far end of the plant, the south end, was next to the carpenter shop. Maurice O'Connor, I think, was the foreman. 
And it was an eight, well, an eight-year-old man, something like an eight-year-old man there by the name of Brown from South Broadway, Albert Brown, who had been a carpenter all his life, and he needed a job, and I just let him repair reels. So he used to use a small repair wheel, with reels, and he had a small bench, and uh, he put it around over there, and it was, and it was a silver, we almost retired job. But he, he did a good job. He knew what he was doing. Well, one summer, one nice summer day, hot day, but it wasn't that was summer, we thought we'd, we had to stencil these big wheels, paint them, we paint them gray, and then we stencil them in orange color. So it read American Brass Company on the top, and the lower U would be Hastings on Hudson, New York, and then the insignia in the center, Anaconda, the subsidiary on the company. Anaconda, and from mine the consumer, across the Indian head. So, uh, we thought it would be great, and a lot of the women were working on the second floor of the insulin. And when we heard that the insulin department, we heard that the day wasn't around, the gentleman wasn't around that day. So we sensed about a dozen of these things, an American ass company. <laughs> <laughs> sure enough, about two o'clock in the afternoon, this guy came down. We went in and see the foreman, and we almost sort of lost our job. <laughs> I think privately he thought it was a, he might have got a sneaker out of it himself. <laughs> By five o'clock or six o'clock, we all had the BR in front of the press. <laughs> I got that. Why they had this picture taken of all those dozen reels out there? <laughs> well, uh, no one. It's the area we passed by. Uh, the school. You start telling me a little bit about the like you, you went. You went to all the patient school then. Yeah, when the school was small, and they opened up the. Uh, the first high school up there, which was a perpendicular to the Washington School, mm -hmm. and your your uh, classes, your over in that school, the, the seventh and eighth grades were taken over there, and departmentalized. You go from English class to French, or you know, French, but to mathematics to geography. Mm -hmm. Around that was a lot different than sitting in one room and having mm -hmm. a single teacher for all your courses. And on the south, second floor was a high school. Mm -hmm. There wasn't many. There weren't too many in high school. Right. Which building is this now? Oh, well, it's, 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 it's hidden. It's hidden by the uh, by the uh, second building, by the big building of the. Uh, oh, it's the Washington building. The Washington building is is, is a big building first, and the uh, uh, just east of it mm -hmm. to the rear, mm -hmm. just south and east of it was a high school building. Oh, oh no, it's not the one on School Street. Yet. Not on School Street. Right. Yeah, it wasn't. It was, this, it was a building on School Street, a private mm -hmm. residence on mm -hmm. School Street, another building. Right. And uh, the private residence right along that School yeah, Street, right. and uh, on School Street, and the private residence on Mount Hope Boulevard. Right. Because the 27 is when they took right. all the uh, stuff out on Mount Hope Boulevard. Right. Yeah. But this was um, this was built about 1910 or 11. This mm -hmm. addition, uh, not an addition, a separate little building. Mm -hmm. And downstairs they had the manual training, mm -hmm. so they did like mechanical drawing, manual mm -hmm. training, uh, uh, social. They call it women do uh, home home in yeah. yeah, they started branch out. Mm -hmm. The high school was a big study hall up there, and that was a little auditorium. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. See, it's hidden. You wouldn't see it. No. It's still, it's still, it's still, the roof burned off. Mm -hmm. Sure, I remember the fire. And uh, we were in those days. Uh, you were asked to do different things. I remember I was sent across to the grammar school one time. Someone else was there. Maybe when I was senior. I was a moving picture out there. They showed movies before they were shown in Hastings Theater in 1922. And they had a projection, had a movie uh, camera um, projector there. But we had to uh, run the films uh, singly, and we had to rewind them outside. And uh, I think it was there from about 1919 on. You want to go to the movies in town, they make money, the classes make money by showing these movies. Yeah. But you'd have to wait between films. Yeah, if you had a real area, you'd have to wait and take one off and, and rewind and put another one in. Where did most of the teachers live? Most of them lived in Dallas Ray and Hastings. They didn't have any other transportation. So they just the bus. Yeah. As Dunbar walked back and forth and was more than 56 grade teachers. I think Miss Dunbar lived in Hastings was one of the relatives on the Lord Ed. Most of them lived in town, and there were a lot of more town people. They suddenly lived with other families, too, I guess. Yeah, they lived with other families. My, my aunt came down from Buffalo, and she went to uh, 
guess it was no cross and all, but she lived with a handy. And uh, so I went to the wedding with my uncle met her there. There was at one point a division in the school. There were some people who were dissatisfied with the school and set up a separate private, a separate school. That, anything about that, that? happened, yes. That happened uh, when Mr. Murphy, uh, a, Herbert H. Murphy, was superintendent. He clashed with the board. He, uh, the about student, what year was it? That would be about 1920. He clashed with the board, and he wasn't doing what the board said to do. And uh, about 19, I got all that stuff up there, too. Uh, I placed a lot of these clippings I'd say that um, just when we were leaving, I know, he was in the YMCA and was abroad. I think he came and got into the YMCA, the National YMCA, and he came back from the war. A lot of people have to do with This has got this thing that was brewing and brewing and brewing with the crash between Murphy and the board, and all of a sudden they, they dropped him. And the PTA, which Doris is more than a caller actor, or in it, uh, were very much, and the parents were very much Murphy. Who was her name? Her name was very mm -hmm. And um, they formed a school. She went to this private school. They formed a school, and it was in Lewis W. Hines' house here. Yeah. Oh, sure. That's where the first school was. That's the first school. And then you're gone. Yeah. And then they got the enrollment got to be 50 or 60 kids with their house, and went down and there was the uh, Christie, the Frank Christie house. Mr. Frank was the house of one of the Swiss chalets. And he was that for half a dozen years or so. Do you remember what the basic difference in philosophy was? What, what it was that we're pretending to have? Well, I guess he wanted to run the school like he wanted to run, and they wanted to run out maybe. I don't, I don't know if there's any pecuniary or a financial situation. There was quite a clash. And, uh, well, the school was still financed through local taxes at that time. Oh, well, what happens if people went to the school that had a financial individual? Well, they had a paper that was a private school. school yeah. so that was the beginning of the Hudson River School, which still exists today up in Irving. Well, that ultimately became... They moved to Master School, mm -hmm. uh, to one of the buildings on Master School property, and they went up to Irving, and that's still a old day school, that's a really country day yeah. school, something like that. But that was a terrific class, and they went out, and they, they had enough support. But they didn't have support. They had a, uh, a bond issue for $650,000. They'd already put these buildings up in 1927, mm -hmm. but they want to add on the school street. Yeah. They want to put that brewery on between the, link the schools together, right. uh, the Washington School and the new high school on, mm -hmm. on, on, on Mount Hope Boulevard. Mm -hmm. They want to do that, and it's three circles up on the top of the thing, a lot of it's called the brewery. And it only passed by 26 votes, uh, and, uh, and the teachers voted. They claim the teachers put this over. Is Hopkins the uh, superintendent this time? The Hopkins was then superintendent. And the new regime was in there. And uh, 13 votes were the other way. And so within three years, all these people have been there for years. I hate to see them vote out of office, but within three years, the whole board was voted out of office. Frank Belfer came in and uh, yeah. all those people, Crowley, Regal, Hopping people. Hopping, Hopping a little later. Yes, yeah. they run up there. But uh, you're talking about the school getting back to school. The, where, the, where the assembly hall was in the Washington School was on the second floor. And that was a gymnasium, an assembly hall, and everything. And it had a platform there. That's where we put on our school show. It was a platform, uh, I mean, a limited yeah. facility. And for basketball, all the people sat at 
sat around, they sat on the platform, yeah. and sat around the edges, and the, the line was right in front of your legs, and invariably the guy who was throwing the ball out, uh, out the, uh, the ball went out of bounds, they were stepping on your feet. On the <laughs> and then of course it was shortened a little bit, they had a, they had the, uh, they had a basket in front of the movie, the yeah, movie the projection thing, it was just like a box. Yeah. On, on stilts, on the four steel stilts on the, on the platform on the box there. Mm -hmm. I remember the, running that thing. I, I, I had a, as you went through high school, you got different assignments from all this. Uh, I was projectionist in the, my senior year. You didn't get anything for this. At one time, I forget who was there with me, you uh, uh, we were teaching the call to take on the next year. Mm -hmm. and somehow or other, we, I don't know what the show was, there was a bad attendance that night. There weren't more than 35, 40 people there. We were raising money for the senior class trip to Washington. I don't know what called up with it, it was other or not. But uh, sure enough, when we, we got a break in the film, we got an awful lot of breaks in this film. We got a break, we spliced them together, we spliced it wrong, and the titles came out upside down. The uh, the, uh, the film, the picture was all right. Yeah. The plant was upside down. And we said the devil that we always go for the rest of the stuff, two thirds through the film, uh, real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> had it been a full house, we'd probably had to uh, uh, re splice it. But uh, it took time to splice it. You didn't have much light there. You had to use a flashlight. I don't remember putting the lights on the assembly hall. You know, I, I, I was kind of sort of sidetracked. I was starting asking you about summer vacation, but I was really thinking of actually this earlier when you were oh, young, like 10. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. In that area, what would you do in summers around town? What's your recreation? How would you keep stuff busy? Well, I got my little job, like uh, watercress and milk and stuff like that. But uh, remember, uh, uh, playing all of course. Games I play. played tennis. I took care of the tennis courts. Uh, when I was a little older, mm -hmm. of course. I used to play tennis a lot. That's where I got the big one. So I heard tennis a lot. Did you have gangs of kids that you hung out with? Well, we hang out. We hung out with the Poles, the Kings. Dan Royal came a little later. Poles and Kings, the Barkers, Spanoshes. And the uh, King, the Scoutmaster, that King. No, this King was Harry King, who became the tennis pro at Sleepy Hollow Country oh. Club. Uh -huh. He learned his tennis in the tire. Yeah. I think Harry was the best tennis player we ever turned out. And, uh, um, they played a lot of tennis. Uh, down, uh, down to the Tower of Jack Lemon Slam. I see, uh, I was 11 years old. Did, did you have a bridge there at that time? The Quad, the Flat River? There was a, I thought so. They didn't put a crossing there, a great crossing, until uh, Hastings had a woodworking mill on the south end of the dive. Mm -hmm. And they forced it. That was one of the great, great crossings. Mm -hmm. But all these places, all these estates, the Shaw State had a bridge across, and they liked the fucking line. They put all these bridges across. Right. Seidenberg, they were in the yeah. Hastings town. They were stressed in the Tower of Jack Lemon. Uh, the Yacht Club was a great hangout for kids. It was a poor head cook did a lot of babysitting down there. Mm -hmm. So we go down there and swim, we have to swim every day. The water was crabbing. reasonably clean? Mm -hmm. What was reasonably clean? It was until, until, until they still started the dock. This yeah. was before the dock. Yeah. The only thing you had was, uh, unfortunately, you had uh, sewage from the open yeah. toilets in the club. Yeah. And so it drained down to the way, depending on what way the tide was. They always went in and put in, you know, always, but okay. the tide was the yeah. best time to go in. But if you wanted some rollers and get to get the thrill of bouncing up and down through uh, simulated ocean waves or these boats, there's an awful lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. Typically from five at night, four thirty on to uh, when the night boats came, a lot of traffic down, and the boats coming down from the day to run. Yeah. You had up the boats going up and down, and you mentioned Sarah Jenks, you had the Raleigh, you had, you had a lot of freighters. And a lot of freighters didn't stop, the first stop would be Newbury. Sarah Jenks was the Austin girl. Did you ever go across the Hudson? Did you ever just uh, ask to roll over and canoe over? Yeah. Always when you climb the Palisades, you got so big stick on kind of hot and covered it. Okay. Yeah. I didn't, I don't think I saw one uh, little travel canoe over there. I see a lot of companies over there. Yeah. Uh, just the hike that moves in the basement. Well, we weren't, uh, uh, we're sort of off limits for uh, the families I used to go over there because we could swim, but. Uh, for that age, the 11, 12, yeah, right, was, uh, yeah. they wanted to be there. When the Royal River froze over in 1918, let's see, I was 13, I remember some people would walk across by themselves, but there were so many pockets, ice jamming up. Mm -hmm. 
But you used to take blinds, so you have five or six people on a line. Just in case. Just in case, yeah. I better get down there. Uh, look.